I'm the fifth president of the United States to address a Notre Dame commencement. The temptation is great to use this forum as an address on a great international or national issue that has nothing to do with this occasion. Indeed, this is somewhat traditional. So I wasn't surprised when I read in several reputable journals that I was going to deliver an address on foreign policy or on the economy. I'm not going to talk about either. But by the same token, I'll try not to belabor you with some of the standard rhetoric that is beloved of graduation speakers. For example, I'm not going to tell you that you know more today than you've ever known before or than you will ever know again. <laughs> the other standby is when I was 14, I didn't think my father knew anything. By the time I was 21, I was amazed at how much the old gentleman had learned in seven years. And then, of course, the traditional and the standby is that a university like this is a storehouse of knowledge because the freshmen bring so much in and the seniors take so little away. <laughs> you members of the graduating class of 18 or 1981 <laughs> I don't really go back that far. <laughs> are what behaviorists call achievers. And while you will look back with warm pleasure your memories of these years that brought you here to where you are today, you are also, I know, looking at the future that seems uncertain to most of you, but which, let me assure you, offers great expectations. Take pride in this day. Thank your parents, as one on your behalf has already done here. Thank those who've been of help to you over the last four years. And then do a little celebrating. You're entitled. <laughs> this is your day, and whatever I say should take cognizance of that fact. It is a milestone in life, and it marks a time of change. Winston Churchill, during the darkest period of the Battle of Britain in World War II, said when great causes are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirit, not animal, and that something is going on in space and time and beyond space and time, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. Now, I'm going to mention again that movie that Pat and I and Notre Dame were in, because it says something about America. First, that Knut Rockne, as a boy, came to America with his parents from Norway. And in the few years it took him to grow up to college age, he became so American that here at Notre Dame he became an all-American in a game that is still, to this day, uniquely American. As a coach, he did more than teach young men how to play a game. He believed truly that the noblest work of man was building the character of man and maybe that's why he was a living legend. No man connected with football has ever achieved the stature or occupied the singular niche in the nation that he carved out for himself, not just in sport, but in our entire social structure. Now today, I hear very often, win one for the Gipper, spoken in a humorous vein. Lately, I've been hearing it by congressmen who are supportive of the programs that I've introduced. But um, let's look at the significance of that story. Rockne could have used Gipp's dying words to win a game any time. But eight years went by following the death of George Gipp before Rock revealed those dying words, his death went dead wish. And then he told the story at halftime to a team that was losing and one of the only teams he had ever coached that was torn by dissension and jealousy and factionalism. The seniors on that team were about to close out their football careers without learning or experiencing any of the real values that the game has to impart. None of them had known George Gipp. They were children when he played for Notre Dame. It was to this team that Rockne told the story and so inspired them 
that they rose above their personal animosities for someone they had never known. They joined together in a common cause and attained the unattainable. We were told when we were making the picture of one line that was spoken by a player during that game, we were actually afraid to put it in the picture. The man who carried the ball over for the winning touchdown was injured on the play. We were told that as he was lifted on the stretcher, he carried off the field, he was heard to say, that's the last one I can get for you, Gipper. Now, it's only a game, and maybe to hear it now afterward, and this is what we feared, it might sound maudlin and not the way it was intended. But is there anything wrong with young people having an experience, feeling something so deeply, thinking of someone else to the point that they can give so completely of themselves? There will come times in the lives of all of us when we'll be faced with causes bigger than ourselves and they won't be on a playing field.